DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Dr. Bunsen serves as the faculty chair of the Catholic Distance University. He is also a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is the author or co-author of over 45 books, including the Pope Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia of Catholic History, the Encyclopedia of Saints, the Encyclopedia of U.S. Catholic History, and Pope Francis. Dr. Bunsen serves as a senior contributor for EWTN. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, wonderful to be with you again, especially to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the remarkable figure of Pope Gregory the First, the Great. Can we, just for those who may not have had the opportunity to hear our previous discussion on this, just quickly again, the context in which we find this quite literally great saint. Sure. Well, we have in uh, Gregory the uh, First a member of uh, the great patrician family. He is the last of the Latin fathers of the church. He's the founder of the medieval papacy. And he gave up a life as a civil servant uh, to become, quite literally, a monk. And he was elected the first monk uh, to become pope. And this, was, of course, is in uh, 590, uh, following the death of Pope Pelagius II, uh, somebody who had trusted him greatly. He sent him as an ambassador to the Eastern Empire, to Constantinople, who had named him his secretary, who had made him a deacon. And Gregory was elected unanimously as successor to Pelagius II. He did everything he could to resist being elected pope. Uh, but he finally uh, accepted the post at a time when Rome, when Italy, when the West were in truly dire straits. Italy was in a state of near ruin. The Lombards to the north, the Germanic tribe, were a chronic threat to the Eternal City. The Byzantines were unreliable allies. And throughout all of this, uh, Gregory was frequently ill from his long-term ascetical practices and his incredible workload. And he devoted himself to solving the problems of his age. In the face of a kind of virtual vacuum of government, he stepped forward and assumed many of the civil powers, uh, a necessary step that also had the benefit of assisting the temporal position of the papacy. He established charities to feed the starving in Rome. He reorganized what was called the Patrimonium Petri, or the Patrimony of Peter, the extensive territorial holdings of the Holy See to improve their financial value, to make them more responsive. And because of the way that he treated the Lombards with respect and with dignity, he actually saved Rome from an attack by the Lombards in 592 and 593 and concluded a, a peace agreement between Gregory and the Lombards. So he was a remarkable civil leader, as we talked about in the first episode, but he also emerged as a towering figure in the life of the church in the West. In this particular episode, we want to focus in on the work that has, can we say, has lasted all this time, and it's still so incredibly strong. Definitely. Uh, we have, we're, we're blessed, I should say, uh, to have uh, such a large body of writings, especially given the turmoil of the era. Now, many of Gregory's contributions to the historical life of the church are not known in, with great clarity or with enormous certainty, largely because uh, many of his works were rewritten over the centuries. There's much that is attributed to him uh, that he did not necessarily have a direct hand in shaping, but that tells us something about the reputation he had. Uh, as I said, this was a colossus of a figure in his time. So, for example, when we discuss the, the great tradition that he was the founder of Gregorian chant, well, he certainly was an inspiration for it and probably had a hand in 
uh, promoting the use of that kind of music, of, of plain chant. But we don't know exactly what role he directly had in bringing about the Gregorian chant that we know today. Nevertheless, the, the fact that he was somebody so beloved, who was so influential, that the Gregorian chant is named as his, in his honor, tells us something about the, the legacy that he left. What we do know is that he wrote over 800 letters and a host of other exegetical writings, spiritual writings. He wrote a book on morals that was actually written in the form of a commentary on Job. He wrote homilies on Ezekiel and he wrote homilies on the Gospels. There is also the, the book of the dialogues uh, that he actually wrote uh, for the the benefit of one of the queens of the Lombards by the name of Theodolinda at a time when Gregory was encouraging her to remain steadfast in her Catholic faith and not to succumb to the temptations, which were so common among the Goths of the era, uh, to be an Arian, in other words, a heretic. And then, of course, there is what was known as the regula pastoralis, or the pastoral rule, that in its time, uh, became so influential that it literally shaped the lives of clerics in the Western Church for centuries. It is noted, for example, that it was second only to the books of the Bible in importance and influence in the, the life and the manners and behavior of priests and bishops. And it was said that at their consecration, the bishops of France throughout the whole of the Middle Ages took their oaths on the collection of the canons of the church and on the pastoral rule of St. Gregory. And so this tells us how widely read this work was. We start, of course, with the fact that he loved scripture. Uh, he spent years as a monk sort of imbibing scripture and developing a sense for it. But, you know, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, who greatly admired Gregory I the Great, made a note of the fact that in all of his writings, Gregory never sought, as Pope Benedict said, to create his own doctrine. In other words, he did not have this desperate effort to be original, which is kind of a hallmark of uh, a lot of theologians today who, who think that they have to reinvent the theological wheel, so to speak, <laughs> and ultimately uh, go off the road, or the wheels come off to, to torture the pun a little bit. Mm -hmm. Instead, what Gregory knew he needed to do was to echo the, the teachings of the church. He wanted, it was okay in, in Gregory's view, as, as Pope Benedict put it, to be a mouthpiece of Christ and of the church on the way that has to be taken to reach God. And that is another expression of Gregory's immense humility. Let's return to one area, the liturgy, that I, th I think it's important that we have a sense that it was so much more than just about music. That yes. the, the liturgy and that unification that it brings is a transmission of the faith, is it not? Well, it is, precisely. And again, context is everything. We, we have an era in which uh, Gregory was building on the work of previous popes, and particular Leo I the Great, in having the universal church recognize that universal authority of the popes. And both Leo and Gregory were very effective in helping the West in particular to accept, to embrace the primacy of the papacy, the rightful place of the church, of the successor of St. Peter and the vicar of Christ. Now, I say all of that because one of the things that Gregory also recognized is the need for uniformity in the worship life of the church, in her liturgy. And he introduced uh, a variety of reforms uh, into the liturgical life of the church. We know, for example, that um, he was responsible for uh, various innovations, uh, for example, uh, saying the, the Our Father um, prior to the fraction of the Eucharist. In other words, we're making a testament of what we believe. 
Uh, we know that uh, he promoted the use of the Alleluia, uh, and he was calling for greater liturgical uniformity at a time when, understandably, in the face of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, that things like liturgical clarity were always going to be victims. And so he encouraged, especially in the lands of the Franks, that were only recently converted to Orthodox, faithful Catholic Christianity. There were obviously things that needed to be done to bring everyone together, to be worshiping properly, to be praying properly, to recognize a rightful authority in the church. So liturgy then is absolutely essential uh, to the effective and authentic Christian life. And so the so-called Gregorian Sacramentary, which of course is one of those great complicated documents as to how it came about, is attributed to Gregory the First. And it's it's proof that he did, in fact, uh, bring about reforms. And we know, for example, uh, from the 8th century, in A Life of Gregory the Great, written by a man by the name of John the Deacon, that he collected what was called the Sacramentary of Gelasius, which was the, the so-called Gelasian Sacramentary, which was one of the, the great sacramentaries in the era before him, and reworked it a little bit, added it, improved to it. And then Pope Adrian, uh, one of his future successors, Pope Adrian I, probably between 781 and, and 791 or so, encouraged who? Charlemagne, the, the great emperor, to take the sacramentary and to apply it to the lands of the Carolingians, the, the, the Grand Frankish Empire. And Adrian, sending him this book, said it had been originally composed, as he put it, by our holy predecessor, Pope Gregory. So we know that the Gregory did have a, a major hand in what became the Gregorian Sacramentary, and more importantly, in that process that we have to have of the unification of liturgical rites and the liturgical life of the Church in the West. Would you say it's true, Matthew, that given the fact for several generations, actually over a couple hundred years prior to Gregory, there had been the great theological battles concerning the different heresies that you have spoken to in the past, that yes. having gone through those councils and the, and the discussions to hone out the, a more fuller expression of the faith, that that communication through the liturgy, the actual worship of the people in that weekly, if not daily, expression, that's why the uniformity was so important, So that because that's how the uh, how heresies creep in, but also this is how you form and you shape the life of the community. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and we see the stress on that, especially in uh, homilies, that these are instruments of orthodoxy, these are instruments of good teaching. Uh, but it's also a way of catechizing uh, the faithful. When you have solid, good liturgy, you invariably have solid, good teaching of the faith. And we have seen that time and again in the, the work of earlier doctors of the church in trying to resist heresy. I and mean, think, for example, of uh, the, the homilies of St. Ambrose, delivered in what? A liturgical setting. And the, the fact that Gregory recognized that the church was moving out of this difficult era of dealing with heresies, even though they were still present to some degree, Arianism was still a, a problem among the Gothic tribes. Mm -hmm. But that liturgical renewal, that liturgical reform, went hand in hand with really helping to shape the, the life of the church, of wider Christian Catholic culture. And so, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, liturgy was one of the key instruments in authentic teaching, 
and of uniformity in belief and expression of the faith. And I, I wonder if we'll ever truly appreciate the importance of his chronicling the life of St. Benedict in that it helped to offer a foundation for the monastic life that would ultimately preserve a much of Western culture through the turbulent era that would follow the, the, the next 500, if not 1,000 years. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. The, the work that you're referring to is uh, book two of what was called the Dialogues. And why did he write this? Of course, he was a monk himself. As we said, he was the first monk to be uh, elected pope, mm-hmm. which meant that, that he was steeped in the tradition and the legacy and the life of Benedict of Nursia. But it's, it's interesting to note that the, the context for his writing about his life was in this, this wider book called The Dialogues. And the intention was uh, to give a book that was actually addressed to a friend of his, Peter the Deacon, in reply to the argument that saints cannot necessarily emerge in such a dark and terrible time as his own era. Mm -hmm. So Gregory was making the argument, no, saints are found in every era. And even in the worst of times, holiness will come out. Saints will be found. And so he was looking at the lives of holy people who demonstrate the fact that (laughs) sanctity is not time-specific, nor is it it location-specific. We find that uh, one of the great hallmarks of the pontificate of John Paul II, who traveled the world proclaiming the universality of holiness and the timeliness of holiness. I go back to that that famous dictum from St. Augustine that you, you tell me the times are evil, will become holier, and the times will get better. Well, in this book, Gregory the, the, the Great is trying to demonstrate that. And in that sense, too, he, he, he talks about the immortality of the soul. He discusses the, the reality of hell. And we look at all of the, uh, the, the reality of eschatology, the four last things. That itself is, is a great contribution. But also, in that second book, he talks about Benedict of Nursia. And gives to the church this great gift of knowledge of the life, the holiness, and that word again, legacy of Benedict. And, and as you pointed out, the, the Benedictine monasteries that Gregory himself did so much to encourage is rooted in this phenomenal work of Gregory uh, the Great, but then especially in Benedict of Nursia. Can we say that he was a mystic? Uh, You know, in some of his writings, I remember uh, there is a line attributed to him. He calls it the the chink of contemplation, Uh that that he saw God as light, this great shaft of light that will come in through our chinks and sometimes just fill a room with light. I mean, this this is somebody who obviously has... uh, been steeped in great prayer. Yes, yes. I think we can see his holiness, uh, the the mystical quality of his work from his scriptural writings. Uh, As I was saying, he spent years contemplating sacred scripture, seeing it as uh, really the, the kind of nourishment that he needs. And therefore, uh, imbuing in him as well the humility to listen to Scripture rather than try to impose one's own expectations on it, which of course is the, is the, the great legacy of, of Protestantism. Uh, intellectual humility of searching, of meditating and pondering on the, the realities of Scripture. And allowing it to become part of you, to listen to what God is saying. 
And it, it's striking when, for example, we look at the, the Book of Morals or the Moralia, which, as I was saying, is this beautiful textbook on morality, but within the framework of a commentary on Job. Now, of course, what do we think of when we, when we hear the name Job? It, it's suffering. And he was certainly uh, an adherent of the, 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 the different meanings of Scripture. And we have the literal, the allegorical, and then we have what's called the moral or the tropological. You know, then in time, uh, we had the fourth sense added, and that is the uh, anagogical or, the, or the, um, the heavenly. But for Gregory, he saw the moral sense of Scripture as primary. In other words, we find in Scripture how to lead our lives. And as, as to go back to what Pope Benedict XVI said about him, you have the, the moral ideal consists in realizing that what, what Benedict calls that harmonious integration between word and action, thought and deed, prayer and dedication to the duties of one's state. In other words, he says, to realize that synthesis, thanks to which the divine descends to man and man is lifted up until it becomes one with God. And so what he's saying is, in this, this book of morals, how to be moral. And, and it flows then from being an authentic believer. And how rich that is for us today and how universal and timeless that is. And, and that can only be accomplished through years of prayer and meditation of that contemplatio on the Word of God. What other contributions should we look for when we reflect on the life of Gregory the Great? Yeah, I, I, I would stress the always looking toward that which is beyond with Gregory. There is in him a deep concern for eschatology, for the four last things. In other words, of always turning to Christ and helping people to understand their eternal destiny. And I stress this because it is very easy. You and I have talked about his great accomplishments of being a civil leader at a time when the imperial civilization of Rome was dying out. And, of course, his legacy with the Gregorian chant, with the Gregorian sacramentary, with all of these great contributions, that here was somebody who was taken up first and foremost with the salvation of souls. And the last thing that, that I think we need to talk about, even briefly, is his fundamental role in the evangelization of Europe. Because he sent out the monks, he, Augustine of Canterbury, for example, to England to convert the Saxons. The great undertaking of the church in the centuries that followed him, with Boniface and St. Patrick and Cyril and Methodius, with Augustine of Canterbury, with countless others, began, realistically, with the decision of Gregory to send out the monks and his priests to the darkest parts of Europe, not just to the lands of the Western Empire that have been occupied by the Goths, but beyond that, to the unimaginably vast stretches of territory, beyond the confines of what used to be the Roman colony in Britain, all the way into Eastern Europe, into the lands beyond the Rhine. This was dark, dark territory. But Gregory knew that the future of the West, the future of the world, rested there with the conversion of those people. But most important, the conversion of their souls, bringing them to Christ, was his greatest worry, and I would say, his greatest accomplishment. We owe an incredible debt to those men who will never know their names, the ones who were sent by Gregory who went into those dark places. Yes, yes. And uh, to be that lumen gentium, to be that light. Precisely. And 
they were the inheritors of Gregory's greatness. You know, we can finish by, by reminding everyone the, the, the famous expression of Gregory the Great, servus servorum dei, to be the servant of the servant of God. And he coined this phrase, and it's a reflection of his humility. It's a reflection also of his determination to serve. And the monks, the priests, the men and women who followed him in that call to evangelize embrace as well the desire toward service and that desire toward humility. And there we see why he is called the great. Any final thoughts, Matthew? Yeah, I, I think um, th that with Gregory, we're moving sort of now out of the, the age of the church fathers. And the doctors of the church now are going to be taken up with a whole new set, a whole new set of issues of dealing with medieval life, of that continuing contemplation on the mystery of God and the beauty of the church, and finding new ways to promote that teaching faithfully and joyously. And so we now move into a new era with the doctors of the church, and it, and it really begins with Gregory. So in that sense, he is a great bridge from one age to the next. Thank you so much, Matthew. Wonderful to be with you, Chris. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this episode, along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.